Hello, good morning. Welcome to the new European Bauhaus kickoff event. We will be starting with some greetings. Um, and first up, I give the floor to Antonio Souza Pereira, the rector of the University of Porto. Hello, good morning, everyone. Dear Minister Manuel Eitor, dear Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, dear Ruth Reichstein, organizers of the new European Bauhaus Go South, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, my greetings to you all and welcome to this event, which marks the launch of the project New European Bauhaus Go South. I would like to thank you for your availability and participation in this initiative, and I extend my welcome to the guest speakers, in particular, who will share with us their ideas, convictions, and projects on issues that most of Europe. The University of Porto feels honored by to be the organizer of the kickoff of the new European Bauhaus Go South which brings together six architecture schools from Southern European countries on a platform of cooperation dedicated to the co-design of sustainable solutions. Through its Faculty of Architecture, the University of Porto is committed to the study, debate and development of new architectural models that respond to the world's sustainability needs. We believe that architecture is an agent for social, economic and cultural transformation, and we see co-design as a way for Southern European countries to respond to common challenges related to the climate emergency. The University of Porto does not shy away from its civic responsibilities regarding scientific problematization and conceptualization, knowledge sharing and dissemination of good practices. We are actively involved in the global debate on the big issues of our era, which include climate change, and we are ready to deploy our best human, scientific and technological resources to its discussion. The cross-disciplinary intersection of knowledge plays a crucial role in promotion of sustainable development. Universities have a duty to create a debate dynamic that not only includes the academic and scientific community, but also political decision makers, public and private institutions, business and general public. It is from this broader discussion that new ideas and challenges emerge, taking into account a more sustainable future for our planet. The involvement of the University of Porto in the new European Bauhaus Go South rises from our commitment to the common good and to human development. As a domain dedicated to knowledge, the University of Porto is committed to knowledge sharing and expansion without borders, while taking the well being of humanity into consideration. Higher education institutions should not be shuttered by ivory towers, allowing knowledge to circulate only within the confines of the academic community. On the contrary, it is up to the universities to be open to the society and to devote special attention to the great questions of our time the answers to which should be found in knowledge. The University of Porto measure contrib contribution to the new European South is exactly that, knowledge. The critical mass which, is, which exists in our Faculty of Architecture allows for the development of innovative and creative solutions. Sustainability, such as special planning, sustainable mobility, new materials, energy efficiency, the circular economy, and smart cities. The Faculty of Architecture has research and development units with advanced skills in promotion of principles of sustainable architecture, which allows it to contribute enormously 
to the resolution of common environmental problems among Southern European countries. All that remains is for me to wish you very success with the new, new European Bauhaus Go South project, certain in the fact that today's event will represent a promising start for this pan-European platform. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best in your work. Thank you very much. We will now have a brief intervention by the Portuguese Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms, Elisa Freire. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it high time that we had some good news? After the last 18 months, isn't it time for a positive vision, a positive outlook, a positive project that you know, Europeans can get behind? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the new European Bauhaus is that project because it is a project of hope. We recognize the pain of the last 18 months. We recognize the challenge of the recovery. We recognize also that one in seven Europeans lives in a dwelling of poor quality and that tens of millions of buildings we need to be renovated if we are to achieve our green goals. In the Bauhaus, we recognize all of these realities, but we say, what if we can, we, what if we can build back better? What if we can use innovative design thinking to rethink our buildings and lives? What if we can make our buildings and lives not just more sustainable, but more beautiful and more inclusive? This is where we get the credo of the new European Bauhaus. It has got to be beautiful, sustainable and together. And we must do this together. <laughs> Let me say, as a proud European from the south or southwest, it does my heart good to see a Southern Bauhaus perspective. Sustainability is a common objective for the planet, but each geography faces particular challenges, shares unique cultural ties, and has a special viewpoint that can contribute to this objective of the new European Bauhaus. Today we face a new transformation. And the new generation must change the economy to save our planet. For many, the European Green Deal is a political priority that may seem detached from ordinary people and everyday life. And let us be honest, for some citizens, the prospects of a green economy may even be a source of worry. They may ask, how much will it cost me? What will I lose? The new European Bauhaus also flips the script for the Green Deal to be about not the cost, but the benefits and the beauty, not inconvenience, but opportunity and affordability, not limitations, but the unlimited creativity when we put our minds together. Our aspiration is the cultural translation of the European Green Deal, making it tangible and connecting people. And ladies and gentlemen, this must be a truly European movement. The new Bauhaus cannot be a creature of a single geography. We must adapt the designs and techniques to specific conditions, local conditions of North and South Europe, of East and of West. And this is why today's event is so important. I welcome the initiative of the six universities to facilitate closer cooperation and co-design. And I will welcome this adaptation to the specific conditions of the South. I welcome this fresh Southern perspective and the mobilization of the expertise also from the South. Your initiative is at the heart of the new European Bauhaus. We planted the seed in January and I am so happy to see the first sprouts blossoming everywhere with such great energy. 
your enthusiasm and initiative, the integration of different perspectives are success factors for the change we want to bring about. Cohesion policy is a natural partner in your quest for local transformation in public spaces. We work with many different local areas, tailoring our approach to the specificities of the area. We have a strong bottom-up approach, working with local authorities and local people, tapping into their energy and building their talents. We invest in the built environment and the construction sector, promoting social inclusion, ensuring that sustainable and high quality solutions are accessible and affordable for all members of society. The new European Bauhaus will develop in three phases or is developing in three phases. First, the design phase, it's going on. It will run until the summer. The new Bauhaus is a bottom-up, as I just mentioned, initiative based on the idea of co-creation. In this co-design phase, we're exploring ideas and shaping the movement, drawing on the expertise and engagement of the whole community. We aim to clarify the concept of the new European Bauhaus by collecting ideas, contributions from virtually anyone would like to contribute, and we have received already more than 1,000 contributions. And I, I look forward to your contributions too, or probably you have already sent them, to encourage a wider dissemination, celebrate existing achievements, and support the younger, we have launched the new European Bauhaus Prizes. These will be, or are, prizes in different categories. And each category will have two strengths. Awards for existing projects, but also awards for concepts and ideas submitted by young talents. I am glad to announce that we received more than 2,000 applications coming from all the 27 member states. Second phase is delivery, building on the design ideas collected over the first half of the year. So this autumn will be vibrant, I, I expect, with new actions, keeping the momentum and the amazing enthusiasm that the co-creation phase has sparked. In the autumn, we will initiate the first five pilot projects, places, concrete places, where the new European Bauhaus concept can be materialized and concretized reviewing business ecosystems and bringing new ideas to the market, creating a new mindset and culture. And the key priority for us is supporting urban, local and regional authorities, also in the incubation of pilot projects. We will need your expertise. So please look out for dedicated calls for technical assistance. They will start in September this year, so next September 2021. And from 2022 onwards, Cohesion Policy's urban innovative actions will also invest in innovative new European Bauhaus projects. And the final phase will be dissemination. This phase will look to spread Bauhaus ideas and projects, both within and hopefully even beyond its borders. I count on your involvement. So in conclusion, I believe it was uh, Einstein who said that our world is a product of our thinking. To change our world, we must first change our thinking. And ladies and gentlemen, the new European Bauhaus is that change of thinking, rethinking and redesign tangible transformations, not just of buildings, but of places, of spaces, of businesses, of products. In making this transformation, let us all be a little bit more like Einstein. Let us mobilize the genius of fresh thinking, fresh combinations of creative minds. Let us bring together artists, designers, architects, engineers, and ab above all, every citizen who wants to participate. Let us remember that the new European Bauhaus is not an elitist con construction. On the contrary, it aims to rekindle relationships with nature, with our planet, with each other, and to build new ones. And most of all, let us ensure that this project of hope, this positive vision spreads to all of Europe. Bauhaus 
must go to the south, it must go to the north, it must go everywhere. So I wish you a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now hear from the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, uh, Professor João Pedro Xavier. Good morning to everyone. Welcome. First of all, I wish to express my gratitude to the EU Commissioner from, for Cohesion and Reforms, Elisa Ferreira, for her inspiring and encouraging words. Very stimulating indeed. To the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education, Manuel Leitor, who cherished NEPCO South's project since its beginning and will conclude today's event. To our rector, Antonio Sousa Pereira, for the University of Porto in unconditional support, and Vice Rector Fatima Vieira, whose enthusiasm and direct involvement on this initiative was decisive to its concretization. To the, to the coordinator of the new European Bauhaus, Ruth Reichstein, for her permanent and decisive role in spreading the seeds of this crucial project where the European Green Deal matches culture. Then to Antonio Chopina, who is going to talk about Bauhaus Echoes on Porto School with the contribution of Alvar Caesar, and our keynote, Matit Kwikinen, for bringing us the Nordic experience on co-designing the new European Bauhaus. A special acknowledgement is due to the incredible organizing team constituted by Filipe Guerreiro, Rodrigo Coelho, and Clara Pimentaval, and the technical staff that made this initiative possible. And of course, to my colleagues, Fatima Vieira and José Pedro Souza, who will moderate these two quite promising roundtables about the Bauhaus legacy and the way it might go south, and to wrap up the results of these discussions, and then wrap up the results of these discussions. Dear experts and students of both tables, finally, it will be your contribution that will build up today's event and make it possible to believe that NEB Goes South will really contribute to the design of the new European Bauhaus as a whole. Thank you for being present. I'm aware that you, we can count on you to push further this project. In fact, this moment is only the first step for a set of events that will take place in our six countries, starting with Athens, Greece, where the subject to discuss will be designing with the landscape. The event leader is Riva Lava from the National Technical University, University of Athens School of Architecture, followed by Porto, Portugal, and the sub subject will be the question of housing and the leader, Teresa Calix. Uh, then Zagreb, Croatia, uh, subject framing collectivity, leader Mia Rothschild-Cherina, University of Zagreb, Fac Faculty of Architecture. From Bologna, Italy, the theme will be the meiotics of the city and the leader will be Francesco Saveri Fer from the Alma Mater Studiori, University of Bologna, Department of Architecture. Uh, in Valencia, Spain, the theme is kilo, Kilometer Zero Architecture. The leader is Deborah Domingo Calduig from the Valencia School of Architecture. And at Toulouse, France, we have Geo Biosource Architecture. The leader will be Rémi Papillot uh, from the Toulouse School of Architecture. Nebgo South, South will conclude with a set of blended intensive programs. Actually, architectural design workshops happening simultaneously in our countries, putting together students and teachers from the six architecture schools of this consortium. Along these thematic discussions, and then giving shape to architectural ideas within the actual design proposals that will emerge at the workshops, we hope to learn all together how to make our designs sustainable and relevant. And I wonder 
if nowadays any architectural, any architectural work can be aesthetically relevant without being sustainable. Reminding our joint statement, I will stress that closer cooperation and co-design cool between Southern European countries could strengthen our ability to cope when faced with our common threats and develop social and nature-based solutions together. Solutions that are therefore sustainable, well, still accessible, affordable, inclusive, and aesthetically qualified as the European Balkans strives to inspire. At the European Association for Architectural Education, Dean's Summit, last April in Oslo, we, I mean, EAAE member schools made a pledge for common action to address the global challenges of climate change, environmental decline, and to work towards sustainable futures. And we agreed in aligning our curricula and research to confront these weak problems with the urgency, leadership, and prominence they demand. We also stated that we recognize equality and diversity within our communities as significant factors for good and will continue to engage in ethical and sustainable design and building practices that respect the diverse cultural roots and traditions of our institutions and commit ourselves to communicate, share and promote the best practices identified. NEVGO South aims to be just another little step to act accordingly. I believe in it with all my heart. Thank you very much for being with us today. We hope to keep your interest for the next events. We also will need your help to bring more people together, not only architects, also students, designers, engineers, geographers, sociologists, other scientists and artists, but in fact, any citizen interested to create a southern perspective for the new European Bauhaus goals to contribute to a climate neutral Europe by 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we will now have an introduction to the new European Bauhaus uh, from the European Commission by Ruth Riechenstein, who is the advisory board to the president, Green Deal and new European Bauhaus. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I have to apologize. I hope that you can hear me. Can you hear me? Thank you very much. Um, we will now have an introduction. Okay, I, I'm not so sure, sorry, I'm, I, it doesn't look very professional here in the commission, but the problem is that um, I cannot use Zoom on uh, any commission uh, computer. I think they are afraid of, uh, do you hear? I, I have the impression that you can't hear me, see me whatsoever. Is there a problem? No, we can hear you and we can see you. Super, Go ahead. good, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, well, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Um, I must say that we are super delighted um, uh, of this uh, new European Bauhaus Go South initiative. Um, uh, so first of all, a huge thanks to all the initiators. Um, we were already very much enthusiastic um, when the Nordic version came up and uh, now it's very good to have also the Southern version at the same time. And as you know, uh, I mean, it's, I, I find it very nice as well that you invited one of the initiators from the South, uh, from the North um, today as well uh, to make the link, because I think that's then the ultimate um, uh, goal in a way to, to find a really European um, vision of this new European Bauhaus. So I will not uh, take a lot of your time. I just want to um, give you again a bit the vision uh, that is behind the project and also link it already a bit to the statement and to what have been said before. So when uh, the president announced the European Bauhaus in September last year, we obviously got quite some critical questions where people said, okay, why do we need this project? Now we are in the middle of a pandemic, aren't there more um, 
uh, important uh, and, and crucial uh, que questions and things to solve. And of course they are, and the president is doing that, be it with the vaccination um, or other things. But at the same time, we also feel that people are really longing for something that gives perspective and hope. And this is what the European Bauhaus is. So it's a project of hope. It's a project that um, stimulates creativity, that gives perspective, that brings people together, and um, that really looks beyond the pandemic and how we want to live in the future. And this is at the core of, of this project. Um, the other part is, of course, that it's also part of the recovery. Um, when we look at the national um, recovery plans that the Commission is looking at at the moment, there are a lot of renovation um, projects in. And of course, it would be great if we could turn at least some of these renovation projects into real European Bauhaus projects. And um, the new European Bauhaus aims at this transformation of the built environment. It aims to bring um, more nature-based and CO2-friendly solutions um, to the to the construction sector and there of course there's also a lot of opportunities and potential um, when it comes to um, economic growth jobs etc so this is really the 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 big thing behind the the hope and the recovery and then um we have um with this in mind uh, developed this triangle um that some of you mentioned already that uh, is a kind of the leading star for the new european Bauhaus, which is sustainability beauty or aesthetics and then the third angle is affordability and inclusiveness and for us it's really crucial to bring the three together because if we if the if the green transformation if the european green deal remains a kind of technical or economic project only it will not succeed we need at one side the culture the beauty things that people can touch and that they actually feel good with and at the same time, we have to make sure that then these solutions do not remain just for the happy few, but that they are really affordable and that we can really bring them broadly um, to our citizens. So this is why this social angle is so important to the new European Bauhaus as it is in the overall European Green Deal, of course. And, um, and, and this will probably be also one of the one of the focus points of the European Bauhaus. I'm, I'm sitting here with a kind of strange background and, and that's also why I was a bit puzzled at the beginning because I'm not in my usual office because we are sitting right now with the team. We are first brainstorming what we will put in our official communication. So that's the document that the European Commission will put on the table in autumn that will be sent then to the European Parliament and to all the member states to react and that we really say, okay, this is what we want to do in this new European Bauhaus initiative. Once that the design phase will be over and where all these contributions that you are now also collecting are so important. And so this event that you are having today is very timely. It was a clear wish from the president to have this project. It's a bottom-up project, exactly because we want to try to bring the European Green Deal closer to the people with this project. We cannot do that by imposing something else from Brussels on people, but we really can only do that when we have the input from um, the grassroots level, from um, experts on the one hand, so architects, designers, scientists, um, but also, of course, companies that are working in these areas. And at the same time, really also the citizens and those who work, for example, more on, on the social questions and also on the digital questions. So we really have try to bring all of this together. So this is this kind of interdisciplinarity that we try a bit to copy from the historical Bauhaus that also started with bringing together people from all kinds of dis different disciplines and developed into a movement. Um, we also have, of course, a lot of people who said in the beginning, well, you are a kind of European bureaucracy. You are not able to launch a movement. Well, true, we cannot do that. I mean, we cannot force people um, doing something. But what we see already is that since um, last September, there is so much that is ongoing. Your initiative is one of the best examples for it. Huh? That so suddenly people come together, they feel new energy, they are motivated again. To, uh, to look into certain things, to, to try to find solutions, to bring innovation, creativity together. Um, and there are so many others. And really now all around Europe, not only um, in the South and in the North, but also in Central Europe, we see more and more initiatives growing. And this is really already amazing. And I think this is already a success that this new European Bauhaus initiative has and that we would love to see growing. And this is also why 
yes, the design phase, so the, the, the period where you can really give input to the concept of the European Bauhaus will soon be over by the end of this month. But also when we have put our communication on the table, we don't want to stop this dialogue that we are having now, this exchange, this, this um, mutual um, uh, input, but we want to continue to have a, a platform where people can talk to each other, where we can always listen to um, what, what is going on on the ground to not lose this kind of very important element of the project. So um, uh, I think you, um, you also know that in uh, September, it will be anyhow a big moment for the project because we will not only have the communication, but we will also have the awards of the first uh, European Bauhaus Prize. Um, where we got over 200, uh, 2,000 um, applications, which is a very nice success because also the application time was very short. So we are now very curious to look into all the projects that have been sent. Um, and we will also have the first call for proposals for the five first pilot projects that we want to um, see growing in this uh, framework of the new European Bauhaus. The details will also be known rather soon. So uh, these are all the kind of things that are ongoing um, at the moment in the project. And we are very much impressed um, what we see, what comes in um, uh, uh, via these different tools in the design phase. A lot of contributions also there from everywhere in Europe where um, there are a lot of uh, great ideas. You can see that um, it's not something that now suddenly starts from zero. A lot of people have been working in all these areas already. And, it's very good to see that now um, we can count on, on this expertise, but also um, a, a lot of uh, new ideas emerge and, and, um, and creativity. And so this is also very nice to see. So we are very happy um, uh, about it. Um, last but not least, and this is, I think is also important with the approach that you have been taken, Europe is not um, like, let's say one country where everything is the same everywhere. We have very different realities in the different member states, sometimes even in, 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 from one region to another inside a member state. And this is something that we have to take into account or that we want to take into account. Um, one of my favorite examples is there always the Portuguese initiative, the Bauhaus of the Seas, where for sure we sitting here in Brussels surrounded by concrete, we were not thinking about the ocean when we were thinking about the conceptualization of the European Bauhaus. But obviously the ocean plays a crucial role in the life of many, many Portuguese or, or, or probably most of them. So um, this is something that we have to take into account. And this is also why it's very good that you are now looking at the European Bauhaus from the Southern perspective, that we have input from other parts of the European Union, and we will for sure not come with a kind of um, one uh, fit, fits for all solution, but we will try to really uh, take this into consideration that the realities are very different from um, one region to another. And that um, also this question, this big question of how we want to live together will probably be answered uh, in a different way, depending of where you live in the European Union. So um, once again, um, a huge thanks from my side for this initiative. Um, we are very much looking forward to get the input that you will gather um, throughout the day. And um, yeah, we hope it's not the last event of the um, new European Bauhaus Go South. And we are very much looking forward um, to, um, to work with you and, uh, and to see this uh, Bauhaus growing. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for your introduction. We will now have a couple short videos uh, with the program for today. The introduction um, from the University of Arch Architecture of Porto and also uh, programming for future Bauhaus events.
E em poucos anos houve uma mudança enorme. Primeiro porque o Carlos Ramos tinha outra liberdade de ação. Para mim é particularmente emocionante estar aqui hoje com o Álvaro César, 42 anos depois. Muito obrigado. Welcome back. Um, we will now have a talk, Alvaro Siza on Bauhaus, the impact of Bauhaus at Porto, Porto School. Uh, this conversation will be led by Antonio Chopina, architect and curator of the exhibition Siza, Unseen and Unknown. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I would, of course, firstly like to thank uh, the invitation uh, to be here today. Um, and extend my congratulations to everybody involved, all the way from the European Union to the different institutions, and uh, in particular the universities, the experts and individuals that are bringing this project to reality, uh, which I'm quite happy about personally. And today we'll be sort of uh, have a short introduction. I'll act, I'll share my screen with you um, about CISA and unavoidably the School of Porta, which are intertwined. Um, and the Bauhaus. So this is a project that started two years ago um, with the Bauhaus Centennial. Um, and so uh, th at the time we did a uh, conference and an exhibition, uh, as was mentioned, uh, about the Bauhaus legacy. I couldn't start without thinking as well, Master Alvaro Siza, without whom this would have been impossible, um, both for his generosity and for his inspiration through his work. Um, and of course, his archive, which is uh, very practical for me to be able to convey um, all of the images necessary um, to translate some ideas. And so for that, I'd like to thank Chiara Porcu and Annabella Monteiro, and of course, institutionally, Tres de Siza, the Marx de Silva Foundation, Fernando Guerra, among others who donated their images. Um, and so this image in particular, which sort of featured as the Bauhaus legacy connection to Siza, is actually a 
uh, photo Excuse montage. me, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yes. we would just like to ask you if you could please full screen it so we could get a better ah, of look course. at Great. your presentation. I thought it was full screen, so sorry. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for the excellent. <laughs> and, so, and so this uh, poster uh, for the Bauhaus Legacy uh, Conference um, is in fact sort of a photo montage that was done on purpose for, uh, for that moment. Um, where CISA with Claudia Perren, at the time director of the Bauhaus uh, Foundation in Dessau, um, and Sergei Choban, where the exhibition was being inaugurated, happened. Um, and so, of course, the, uh, they are all together with Christine Ferres at the Aegis Architecture Forum in Berlin, as sort of co-participants in this conversation that happened at the time, and which, which we'll now extend in a way. Um, and so the exhibition itself was about it was called Caesar Unseen and Unknown for a very particular set of circumstances, which is a lot of the drawings that were unknown in a sense. Caesar is a prolific designer, as you know. And, um, and so in this case, also because um, Caesar shares a lot of uh, coincidences with the Bauhaus history. Uh, one of them is this one. He was born in 1933, uh, with the same year that the Bauhaus uh, closes its doors. And um, he is perhaps uh, the last true modernist, or at the very least, uh, the most significant voice to carry out the modernist unfinished project into the 21st century. And um, the exhibition is in a way also a tribute to another one that happened 100 years before, uh, the exhibition of unknown architects by the Workers' Councils of Art in Berlin, uh, which was sort of the stepping stone for the creation of the Bauhaus. Uh, with very little known characters like Walter Gropius and um, Bruno Taut. And so Gropius sort of continued Taut's ideal of the building of the future, which would be simultaneously architecture, sculpting, painting, and so all of it together in a sense. Um, this also coincides on the other edge of the Caesar's timeline with the, the quite recent construction and inauguration in 2018 of the what we call the Bauhaus Museum in China and Hangzhou, um, um, but it is officially the China Design Museum. Uh, I have the two buildings here side by side, and uh, so one can see even though they are quite dramatically different, at the same time th there's unavoidable sort of coincidences, which in Caesar's case are never coincidences. They all he always finds a way to sort of convey sort of imaginary ideas, invisible sort of concepts that are transversal throughout his work. The same could be said for this quite famous bridge connecting the Dessau School um, and uh, uh, Caesar's upcoming museum in Shanghai, the Haishang Museum, uh, and this very athletic sort of struggle to defy gravity that the museum uh, tries to achieve. And Caesar himself was an, an athlete to begin with, uh, there he is uh, playing hockey in the late 40s. And um, that was his big dream before architecture. Uh, unfortunately, not a dream that could have been carried on. Um, and here uh, we ha have also this almost Olympic scene at the Bauhaus. So always this idea of mind and body working together towards uh, a better future, in a sense, constructing an ideal of a better future. Uh, Caesar, of course, leaving his dream of uh, playing ring hockey, uh, tends towards the arts. His father, being an engineer, of course, wants something more technical and less bohemian sounding. Um, and so he enrolls in architecture uh, at the School of Fine Arts, um, which together, uh, back then were together, the School of Fine Arts and Architecture, uh, which was led by this man on your right, uh, Professor Carlos Ramos. Uh, strangely similar now to Walter Gropius, uh, perhaps because I've been looking at them too much, um, but similar mostly on also a personal level, which is the uh, Carlos Ramos was a Bauhausian, not in the sense that he went to the Bauhaus either as a teacher or as a student, but um, uh, in the sense that he truly believed in the core values of the Bauhaus, particularly as a, an educational uh, system. Um, and so he really wanted to bring together under one single roof of the school um, all of the arts, the painting, the sculpting, the architecture, they would all contribute, it would be a shared discipline uh, where they could interact. Um, and so this was quite a fundamental stepping stone um, at the school. 
He also translated most of Walter Gropius' texts into Portuguese, um, which is very important because one of the advices that Carlos Ramos will give young Caesar uh, when he didn't know really what to respond to one of his projects is to invite him to buy some books and architecture magazines. Uh, and so Caesar goes out in a story that perhaps would not happen today because of the internet uh, and buys a, a, a few Architecture de Rudui magazines. This is one of them, of course, about Gropius and his school, uh, which will have a direct impact on his first project uh, at a very early age. Uh, so this is 1952, so he was uh, quite, quite young. Uh, he, and, um, and so his grandmother's kitchen is in a way a functionalist kitchen, a Bauhaus kitchen in that sense. Even the wires, if you notice, on, um, on the furniture are placed in a way so his grandmother could close and open all of the cupboards with her knee without actually having to bend down. And so everything was thought up uh, in a very particular way, to even to the light fixture at the top, which he designed on purpose, and today is irreplaceable because it's no longer reproducible. Uh, that type of lamp no longer exists. And, and so sort of all of these small influences on sort of a technical and practical level exist, but also on a theoretical level, because in this magazine, the Gropius writes a text called um, uh, training uh, about the training of an architect, of a young architect, uh, in which he focuses a, a, lot, a long a series of themes, which Caesar also has focused most of his career. Also that in the belief that architecture is art um, and not just technique uh, and that, archite that architects are not specialists, but generalists. And so there is a series of concepts that sort of come from this early momentum in Caesar's career, which will be in a way sort of um, uh, this momentum will grow thanks to Fernando Tavora, who you have on your right. Um, with Caesar's teacher, then later boss, then lifelong friend, as you can see uh, by the playful attitude that they have together. Fernando Tavaro was a young teacher at the school. Uh, he participated in the International Congresses of Modern Architecture with Le Corbusier um, and was sort of a very relevant catalyst for Portuguese architecture and abroad. And so he will, in a sense, uh, transfer a, pro a project from, one for him, from his office, which was the famous Boanova Tea House, which is here being presented to the mayor. And so this project, which was worked upon by Alvaro Siza and five other members of the studio as collaborators while Tavara was away traveling. And when he returns, he recognizes obviously that Siza's input was too great and that he should be recognized as the, as the author of this building. And so there's much debate about and speculation about the influences of Alvaro Alto and the Buenova Tea House, uh, Alto, of course, um, being another of the Architecture de Jodui magazines that Alvaro Siza will buy at the same time as Gropius. Um, uh, and it has sort of a mo much more long lasting relationship, um, particularly because Alto um, will have this connection with Siza. They're both striving to find an architectural contemporary language for the country in a sense, for themselves firstly, and then something uh, uh, contemporary language uh, for Finland, for Portugal. And so they have that in common among many other things. It is curious that uh, later on after Gropius' exile, um, he will be talking to Lucio Costa in Brazil and he will mention how extraordinary it is that it is Finland sort of all the way up in the North and the Brazil all the way down in the South the two countries at that point really sort of bringing a subject matter of conversation, both for peace, of course, after the war, and for sort of an aesthetic and a, a, an architectural language of value. Um, and so right after the tea house almost embedded the, the, the also very famous uh, oceanic swimming pools uh, by Alvaro Siza are in a sense um, one, what one could call Gesamtkunstwerk, or this totalizing work of art. It's a very romantic notion, which can obviously lead to a lot of debate among critics, um, but it is also a very important theme among the Bauhaus, this idea of the totalizing work of art, uh, which in this case comes to fruition, in my personal opinion, through this sort of extension of the architecture and nature, sort of symbiotic uh, in connection. 
and then construction and the art also sort of detailing from the woods and, and the partitions. So all of that together sort of brings us to a very sort of particular and unique space in the world. Um, Alvaro Siza actually gets married uh, right in front of the tea house uh, to Maria Antonia Marin Light. And um, that is not a sort of an unusual, she was an artist he met at the fine art school. I put them here side by side with Annie and Joseph Albus. I chose the Albus, but I could have chosen any other sort of couple from the Bauhaus. It's quite common uh, sort of because of the proximity uh, that we can then find with this young architect and this young artist fall in love and fuel each other's passion for the art that they produce. Um, sadly, Maria Antonia will not live long enough to see the revolution happening in Portugal, the Carnation Revolution 1974. Uh, it will be quite a sort of a, a dramatic moment in Portugal and a happy one. Um, and it will bring about a, a process which many of you have heard about probably, the Sal process. Um, which will locally support low cost housing. And so architects will participate together with associations of uh, homeowners and to build all of these new houses. These are two examples of Alvaro Cesar's houses, one very early on together with Eduardo Sotomora, who was a student at the school, St. Victor, and one a little bit later, Bosa, which became sort of uh, quite iconic within the revolutionary movement to the point where there were buses with the stairs painted on the side mimicking uh, the project itself. And of course, the Bauhaus was also quite famous for this idea of building low cost housing. Housing was quite a big issue during the Weimar Republic years. And so Gropius and the school will sort of lead the way in the, in the 1920s uh, when it comes to social housing. Um, and these large sort of um, districts almost um, of housing uh, will have, for example, in Portugal, uh, their uh, climax with Malagueta, which is this district in the south in Evora. Uh, all the other interventions were in a sense sort of solving urban issues within the, the, the concrete fabric of the city. This will be sort of a much more larger plan by Alvaro Siza with many, many houses being built simultaneously. It will be also at the, the, the beginning of his very famous uh, sketchbooks. He will start buying sketchbooks to sort of organize all of the work that was happening at the same time. And these angels seem to start soaring over all of the sketches um, in a way which is quite curious, almost as if conveying hope to those less fortunate who were being given uh, now new homes, a little bit like the movie Wings of Desire by Vin Vendors. Um, and so there's this coincidence that then he would then go and work in Berlin. Uh, and also this idea of the angel as this almost sort of creature out of time, who's looking at the past, but then whose wings are being pushed towards the future by, um, uh, by the wind, uh, as Walter Benjamin used to say about Paul Klee's angel. And so this is one of Caesar's sketches, uh, the angel in a way dismembered, it's a metaphor for the city of Berlin as he arrives. Um, as a, the, the city or the body of the city dismembered by time, by war, by a series of difficulties. And it's the architect's job, in a sense, to sort of sew back together this body, which is the city and the architecture and by consequence life. Um, and so there is this uh, way of looking at the world, which is particularly unique, a little bit like in this sort of almost unbelievable uh, picture by Bayer here on the right. Um, and this sort of perspective on the world will be very, very important in 1976, when Cisa, um, at the recommendation of uh, Vittorio Gregotti, is invited by François Buchert, uh, at the time director of the IDZ, the Design Center in Berlin, um, to participate in the Design Week. And Cisa, unlike all the other participants like Bohm or the Smithsons, is going to propose to maintain many of the existing voids in the city of Berlin. It, he says there's no point trying to patch up and pretend like there was a facade and nothing happened. We must recognize the history of the city and, and instead sort of analyze deeply which moments should be intervened in and how, and in a way opening up all of the city blocks and the inside, the garden insides of the city blocks into the city. And so because of this, he will participate in a series of competitions for the IBA, 
the IDC Design Week is in a way a stepping stone for um, the, the, the International Architecture Exhibition in the 80s. And this is one of the exhibitions, the, the competitions that CISA participates, but unfortunately does not win. It is really thanks to Brigitte Fleck here um, that he gets invited to his first IDA competition, which was a swimming pool, which again, he doesn't win because uh, they thought it looked too Turkish with a dome. Uh, but perhaps one of the most important projects, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, that CISA did not win in Berlin is the Kultur Forum. Uh, it was won by Hans Hollein, who also did not get to build the building. It's still an empty void in the center of Berlin. And it's the, the sort of, at the time, um, the community center for the church, the parish of, of St. Matthäus, which is right next door, where Mies van der Rohe was baptized, hence why he aligns his own uh, new national gallery through this church. Uh, and so this is a very interesting project because he has to deal with this puzzle a very complex uh, existing urban ideas, but also buildings by Hans Schaffoon, like the Philharmonic and the National Library, uh, the Neue National Gallery by, by Mies, um, and of course, a much newer building by Sterling later on. Um, the Neue National Gallery in particular has this sort of coincidence uh, with Caesar's work as it evolves, because as Mies also sort of migrates to uh, America, he starts really sort of overextending the roofs in a Frank Lloyd Wright-like way, um, which is something that Caesar, if one looks at the modulation of this roof and its overextension uh, nowadays is doing in Asia. This is a mausoleum in Shinpao Mountain. Uh, and so there is sort of a, a rhythm and a rigor, an almost Mesian rigor in the modulation uh, of this structure. Uh, but also even in other particular details, whether it is in the overextension of these planes from the brick, the brick country house by Mies or the overextension of the brick planes and the Homebright Pavilion by Caesar and Noyes, um, or even of course the quite famous Weizenhoff Siedlung and its sort of vertical um, staircase um, negatives and the cantilevered slabs, which in a way will influence a lot of how Caesar will be designing and thinking about his own uh, housing units all over the world. This one, particularly in Porto, his most famous, of course, is this one in Berlin, which is the only project that he will, uh, in fact, build from all the competitions uh, of the 80s in Berlin, uh, which was nicknamed the Bonjour Christesse uh, because of the graffiti that you can see at the top. And this building, uh, together with Peter Brinkert, who was the architect that accompanied it locally, um, will be very, very important for CISA, both internationally as a sort of a projection, but also for this understanding of the city and how to treat residents. These were buildings destined for, in particular, Turkish families that were there for reconstruction after the war. Um, and, and so the redesign of the building was not, not simple, but I quite love sort of looking at this plan and really understanding how CISA always looks at, on, at our architecture in an almost anthropomorphic way. If one looks at this as a section of a leg and a knee in particular. And, and so this idea of the sort of the human body experience or experiment was something that was introduced into the Bauhaus by Oskar Schlemmer and sort of this idea of the quick sketch by Kandinsky as well, this idea of the human movement and how it translates into architecture. So here at the School of Porto uh, at FAUP, uh, the first uh, pavilion, which was built at Carlos Kamisch Pavilion in homage of the original director I mentioned, uh, has almost this face-like uh, elevation uh, in a way very reminiscent of the Bauhaus logo. Um, and it's sort of a calling Sort of a human calling to the building as well um, and in a sense again this idea of continuity which also exists in Caesar architecture and uh, continuity with history either through Adolf Luz or Palladio uh, or even the 19th century houses in Porto which all sort of had sort of face-like uh, facades in their design two windows and one door um, this group uh, this is one of the many pictures that we could have chosen of people um, from the school or practicing at the time, they become a quite close-knit uh, group of people working, collaborating together. There's sort of the spirit of optimism, particularly after the revolution and sort of the construction, bringing houses to people less fortunate, et cetera, which will lead of course to this construction of the new house 
uh, a new school of architecture. Um, and sort of this camaraderie that happens uh, between all of them, and even almost familiarity because he's his own son and nephew uh, have studied at the school, um, is sort of very reminiscent of the Bauhausian avant-garde, specifically when just opposed against uh, sort of the white rendering of the Neues Baun, which we, when we look at the buildings, now slightly wider since the building was renewed, which I'm quite happy about. Um, and so this sort of camaraderie translates also sort of uh, outside of the school. And uh, so it's cooperation when it comes to work, to academics, uh, but also sort of friendship. And so we have sort of the popular saints here on the left, or we have this Bauhaus costume party, quite famous costume parties, where Walter Gropius used to dress as Le Corbusier. Um, and, um, and so the faculty, in a sense, the school becomes in itself a museum, uh, but not uh, sort of a, a museum enclosed in itself, a one which is proactive and exhibiting sort of uh, the, the material that is being conceived yearly. And so it is sort of an actionable information that we can take upon. So it's not merely a museum where one would archive things as in the past. So the big inspiration for that uh, museum at the school actually is this museum in Ghent uh, that Marc Dubois brought Caesar to. And then, so very different. So you, you can find the similarities and then also the big differences, both in the, the core essence of how spaces are supposed to be used. Um, and also in this sort of historic play that Caesar creates, for example, the Guggenheim Museum uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright in New York, or the Dom headquarters in Cologne, which is the first building that Caesar designs in a computer. And so hand drawing is still sort of a fundamental element um, for Caesar in particular, but also for the school, uh, or even reinterpreted again, the Guggenheim at the Iberica Madre Museum in Brazil. And so this idea of the ramp. So this intersecting of sort of handcrafting in a sense of direct drawing um, and then technology brought into it um, uh, optimizes results, which is something that we hope to achieve as well with the new Bauhaus. So during the construction of, of the museum that I've just shown, he of course visited uh, Oscar Niemeyer at the Kanoa's house. Uh, Oscar Niemeyer was the one that uh, was helping with all the official paperwork for the museum locally. Um, and he mentioned at the time when Gropius visited the, the Kanoa's house and mentioned that it was very beautiful, but um, not multipliable. And Niemeyer sort of took that very personally as an offense and never wanted to hear about the Bauhaus afterwards. Um, uh, and so Caesar, of course, uh, was an inheritor to both notions, of course, uh, ever since being a young architect, to this idea that, of course, multiplication is necessary, industrial uh, multiplication and reproduction in order to build houses for the many. And it is unavoidable but also this idea of uniqueness, of the identity of specific things, almost as if a building was sort of a jazz composition, which varies constantly. And so the Bauhaus was quite famous for their own uh, band, uh, their jazz band. Here is Caesar sort of uh, fake playing in his orchestra, hand drawn for the, the Rotterdam Tower that he designed called New Orleans, who is also quite famous for its jazz music. And so you have here the New Orleans Tower in Rotterdam on our left, which was the tallest tower in the Netherlands at the time that it was built. Um, uh, and it sort of drinks, it sort of brings in the sources, of course, of the towers that were built in Chicago um, throughout uh, several decades. And in particular, the Chicago Tribune competition, which is still today to a very relevant and symbolic moment. And nowadays, CISA uh, has under construction, it's almost finished a new tower in New York City, uh, it's 611 West 56th Street in New York. Uh, they're now sort of cladding the facade. And this one as well drinks from sort of local sources, of course, of the Fifth Avenue um, school and, and Mies unavoidably. I usually call it the White Seagram building for sort of this rhythm, like this rigor and pristine sort of understanding uh, of the building and its proportions and its windows. Um, this overextends, of course, to light as well. This idea of natural light penetrating buildings is, of course, fundamental, not only now that uh, after the pandemic, 
and how we realize the importance of courtyards, balconies, and natural light and sort of the health uh, of people living in these environments. Um, but also in this idea of the almost historic continuity of the understanding even of the Roman impluvium in a sense. Um, and so it is no uh, surprise that Caesar's uh, architecture as a body of work has now been nominated for a UNESCO World Heritage, uh, much like Le Corbusier's work had been. Um, it is still under consideration, of course, at this point. Um, but it is sort of uh, understandable given sort of Caesar's very clever uh, sort of rethinking of form, constant rethinking of form, much like the Bauhaus continuously reinvented form, um, or the sort of abstraction of concept, which is continuous throughout his, throughout his work, even if sort of the human being is always in the back uh, of his mind uh, as the ultimate uh, receiver of this. Um, or, of course, and the articulation between craftsmanship uh, and industrial production. And so we have two examples here of chairs, one by Caesar, one by Joseph Albus. And, uh, and so uh, this, this understanding of how industry plays a part as well in new conception, or even in this idea of continuity and discontinuity um, of function, whether it is the ashtray for somebody who smoked quite actively like Caesar, um, but that we hope is something that will decrease over time um, also through legislation. Um, and of course, materiality. Um, so Caesar is always sort of in reinventing his own materiality. Quite recently, for example, in this pavilion for Shanghai's Furniture Fair, um, where he brings the inside um, um, insulation to the outside as the skin of the pavilion, this almost silver sheet, which is the insulation of the pavilion, becomes its apparent form. And uh, the same we could say for at the right for this winery, which is completely covered in this eco-friendly um, compressed con cork block. And so to reinterpret cork, this is very sort of a common material in Portugal for a facade, uh, which is quite resistant and uh, thermically um, also very efficient. Um, and so he keeps sort of innovating in a way. So tradition and innovation come hand in hand, even when it comes to sort of reinterpreting sort of um, lifestyle traditions, whether it is sort of in Asia, sort of um, the tradition of having people welcome you uh, at the door of buildings, which Caesar in an almost sort of uh, allegorical way uh, transfers into stone through the sculpture, which welcomes people at the entrance, or whether the redesign of the sunglasses that he is wearing uh, which we associate, of course, with Le Corbusier, with John Lennon, but then he does it with new technology, with lightweight aluminium. So he's always sort of reinventing uh, things, but in a way that is continuous with history. Um, and this is, in a sense, logical, because if we think of Peter Bern's original office, most of the Bauhaus team um, had worked there, uh, like Mies, of course, and Meyer, Gropius, uh, and so many of us who have been fortunate enough to uh, accompany Master Alvaro Caesar throughout the years, and particularly at the school here in Porto, um, uh, we are very aware that we have a responsibility and a contribution to give to the world uh, also through him. And so let's put on our thinking hats, so in Caesar's case, this model of the Yan Yang Pavilion, uh, and try to uh, make this new Bauhaus count. Sometimes I wonder how some people relate quality with the, the cost, high cost, uh, in modern architecture as the base, the big um, success of modern architecture comes exactly of building with great quality for many people. Uh, and there was, uh, almost in the beginning of modern movement, in a second phase of the, the success of modern uh, movement, a 
comes from the needs of reconstruction after the war and the reconstruction for everybody, for many people. So social housing, social programs were in the base of success and of definition of modern architecture. And uh, I think it has to be maintained like that. Not uh, working for elites, but working for everybody. Everybody deserves and understands quality. There was, I could say, anxiety for the possibility of modernity, which was not very well received. Uh, and uh, there was a group of very good teachers, many young contracted by a new director, uh, that had already contact, international contact. So, in a way, the students coming from the School of Porto are also aware of also this wish and some preparation for a possible change. As inside the universities before the revolution, there were strong movements towards conquest of freedom and the relation with the outside cultures. Uh, after that revolution, there were programs for social housing, for housing for people that until then had not access to a dying uh, house. So it was influent in my uh, evolution of my work. And also, it was the, the reason for invitations, for the first invitations I had to work uh, outside, to work in Berlin, to work in Holland, uh, everywhere and many places. So this transfer from the south to the north and the, the opposite uh, uh, is also a characteristic of modern move, movement. And uh, today we assist to, a, in a way, a similar moment where the different cultures enter in contact. And that is becoming much more important and more needed than conflicts. It's an example of this uh, mutual knowledge and interest between different cultures. And that is very positive. Thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. We will now have a short coffee break. Um, if you would like to interact with other participants or viewers, you may head on over to our website. Under the tab intervals, you'll be able to find a meeting in which you can interact with other people if you so wish. Uh, we will meet back up in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. See you soon.
Welcome back. Our uh, next segment will be the keynote speech, how to co-design the new European Bauhaus experience from the Nordic countries. This keynote speech will be given by senior specialist at the Ministry of Environment of Finland, Mati Kuitinen. Take it away. Hello everybody and warm greetings from Finland. Uh, at this time of the year, we hardly have any nights, all it's very light, but as a compensation, we have lots of mosquitoes. So this is the context where I'm giving you the presentation from. So uh, I'll be talking about uh, our experience of how uh, we have tried to uh, engage with the stakeholders in the uh, co-design of the new European Bauhaus. And I hope that that will be beneficial uh, also for you uh, when, when you are doing uh, regional activities. And I hope that we can also learn something from, from, the, from the work that you are doing in your region. Uh, I have divided the work in uh, this presentation in three parts. First, I will be tell, telling you a little bit of the background where we come to this uh, co-design. Then I'll be showing you some of the results and conclusions from the, from the work that we have done so far. And finally, as I am an architect as well, I uh, take the opportunity to share some of my own reflections on the new European Bauhaus and its development. So this is the frame for, the, for my talk. So uh, uh, I'd like to start with the words of a uh, famous Finnish architect, Alvar Aalto. He wrote decades ago that the ultimate goal of the architect is to create a paradise. And of course, this is a lovely starting point for all sorts of things that are related to sustainable and inclusive construction and design and built environment. So uh, as a policy framework, however, uh, it's not hard to figure out what are the main drivers uh, for our societies uh, in, in Europe at, at the moment. It's one of the key issues, of course, is the climate change and its, re uh, its reflections to the built environment. Uh, our political goals include uh, achieving carbon neutrality uh, by year t uh, 35, and thereafter we are aiming at becoming carbon negative. And for doing this, we are seeking for inspiration, of course, from nature in a pretty, pretty similar process as a great design and architecture has also done. So we are looking at the natural flows of carbon, how, how carbon is bound to the woody biomass in Finnish forests and how it's released back again into the atmosphere in a beautiful balance. And we are concerned that we cannot find such a balance in the built environment. However, we recognize that we should have that sort of balance. And therefore, we are constantly and repeatedly asking the question, how should this influence architecture? But it's, of course, not the only thing that's of concern today. We have tons of questions, big problems, big questions regarding to the uh, the demographic structure of the Nordic countries. We have lots of aging population and degrowth in population. We have a serious biodiversity loss because the change in climate is hitting hardest here uh, in the north. Uh, our uh, degrees uh, have gone up close to three degrees Celsius in 100 years. So we are already beyond 2.8 degrees of global warming and which means that we hardly have snow in the winter anymore which has changed the typical landscape of the north and again that used to be the inspiration for nordic artists and designers and artists and now that landscape that inspirational landscape is in very rapid change of course we have problems related to health uh, and uh, living health and living conditions and the quality of construction and of course the stagnating productivity of construction that's, uh, that uh, is, is there uh, has been a problem for decades. So there are lots of question, questions that might be sort of like fuel for new form of architecture and design that's related to the built environment. So uh, therefore, understanding this as a background, we have now uh, Jointly with our Nordic neighboring countries, Sweden, Norway, Denmark and Iceland, we have been thinking that what Nordic policies, which policies could influence our architecture and built environment. And of course, climate neutrality. This is one of the things that is, is, is a 
common denominator for all the Nordic countries, and which is exemplified rather often through, for instance, wood construction. Then, of course, we have very high goals for a circular economy. Uh, it's been seen in the uh, material production and, and in design principles, and we are very hard at the moment working for the revision of EU's construction products regulation, which, although it sounds super boring, is very pivotal for taking circular economy into the practice of architects and designers. And then we are investing pretty much on digitalizing public services. Uh, our goal is that all services should be primarily digital. And of course, this is seen in the built environment. There is a remarkable development of digital twins and building information modeling used for applying for building permits and so forth. So all of these might perhaps some have some relevance for the new European Bauhaus, which is a significant cultural initiative. So therefore, we took these background, the, the policy initiatives that we have as a background for the uh, co-development of the new European Bauhaus here in the north. So how we did that, we have actually an administrative frame called the Nordic Council of Ministers. So basically all Nordic countries, they share this organization and which is represents all the authorities of the Nordic countries. And Finland is the chairman at, uh, during this year. So therefore, we invited all our neighboring Nordic countries into this co-design of the new European Bauhaus and to explore how the ideologies and, and the goals of the new European Bauhaus might resonate with the existing Nordic policies. So therefore, we have facilitated a series of Nordic co-design webinars and workshops. And in addition to these, there has, there has been a lots of like national and regional workshops uh, in, in addition, but these, uh, there has been a series of pan-Nordic workshops. And uh, this has been carried out in a collaboration between different ministries from different Nordic countries and different architect and designer associations from different Nordic countries. So, so far we have had uh, five different events and there are more to come. The events were thematically arranged so that we first had a, a sort of like Nordic kickoff and then actually we ask the participants uh, to have their say that what do they want to talk in the next co-design event. And based on the vote results, we then organized the following result, uh, workshops. So we wanted to do this in the inclusive spirit of the Bauhaus initiative. So far we have uh, attracted close to uh, 1,700 participants, which can be seen as a very good number in our small countries. We have very uh, small population, as you know, and we have collected hundreds and hundreds of different post-it notes, chat memos, and all different views from, from these events. And we have been analyzing these pretty much and, and just published them as a report. So uh, we then, then arranged all the data that we got from these workshops along the triangle that you all remember from uh, the new European Bauhaus initiative. Uh, if these uh, themes were related to aesthetics or inclusion or sustainability. And we could, from all that huge bulk of, of input, we could identify 22 different categories. And then we divided these categories into their relevance to the different aspects of the Bauhaus. So regarding the aesthetical side, there was lots of expressions of uh, that we need to have new sort of aesthetics and narratives that can support a change in the way that we design, build, maintain and disassemble the buildings that we have. And then uh, there was lots of things about how the nature bound aesthetics have to be rethought. As I mentioned already earlier, uh, the Nordic winters are changing very rapidly. Uh, for those of you who have had the uh, possibility of visiting our countries in the winter time, maybe in the past you have noticed that there is a lot there, although it's very dark all the time, the snow in the country gives you a sense of lightness. But now as the snow is melting and we have less and less snow every year, we actually see an increase 
in the mental problems. Uh, it's when it's dark all the time, depression and that sort of things are increasing. And then there is the question of how much artificial light and, and what's the role of light in outdoor when it's dark has risen into a new sort of a level. And then, of course, regarding aesthetics, there is always the discussion about quality over cost. So how much can we invest in something that goes just into something that's in vain in brackets, if it's just some decor decorative stuff on top of uh, otherwise pragmatic building project. So uh, then when we look at the sustainability side and what sort of uh, inputs have we uh, classified from there, uh, there are, of course, things that are related to the relationship with nature, biodiversity in cities, and how does the density of cities support uh, these uh, needs. Then there are lots of uh, interesting ideas about local and traditional metals and materials, wood and spe in special, and other organic materials. Of course, circular economy, zero waste, and about the favoring of retrofitting against demolition are, are showing up in our data. So actually, when you look at this, these don't feel that these are very novel. These are mostly what's been discussed all over uh, in different organizations and, 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 and fora in, in the European context. Then uh, regarding the inclusion side, uh, it appears that there is a strong uh, sentiment that uh, health and well-being, of course, need to be promoted. Uh, urban and rural, rural areas to be connected. Learning is identified as an important thing. Digitality and, and participation stand up in the results as well. And then some uh, of the inputs that we got couldn't be actually uh, like clearly pointed towards any of the, uh, of the uh, peaks of the triangle, but they were more, more like cross-cutting themes. Uh, such as uh, innovation or a need for establishing a new Nordic academy for uh, promoting the ideals of the new European Bauhaus, and so forth. Then we could also, uh, we tried to analyze the, all the, the bulk of the material and, and recognize strong and weak signals. And um, maybe also unsurprisingly, uh, the emphasis was pretty much on equality and participation. Of course, nature stood up from, from the data and sustainable solutions. But what, what, what we could read between the lines was that understanding of us humans as an important immaterial resource that can could possibly partially replace uh, the needs for material consumption could be identified. So uh, then we also ranked uh, all the input in their relation to sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And, and uh, the results uh, show, again, rather unsurprisingly, that a sustainable development goal number 11 about sustainable cities and communities is the most often referred to. And then we have a a, a smaller dominance of, of the other sustainable development goals. But I think that it, it's an interesting exercise when we talk about this new European Bauhaus to try to compare that to other frameworks of sustainability or design or aesthetics and see that how do these cross compare because then it's easier to, to find uh, uh, implementation areas for the new European Bauhaus initiative. Then what did we learn from this exercise? And now I'm reflecting um, like based on the data that we collected, something that maybe might be relevant for you. And uh, again, it would be interesting to hear that, how do you see these things in, in South? I think this cross European comparison and collaboration would be most beneficial. So uh, we could clearly identify that, that there are lots of benefits from regional co-design. It is, of course, much more resource efficient than if countries would be doing this on their own or if universities would be doing this on their own or, or any other stakeholders. Uh, I think that we got better quality and, and we were faster in the development than if, if we would have used our own individual resources instead of collaboration. Of course, the collaboration takes some uh, uh, resources, but it can give you back much more. 
then I think that it was possible to, to gain much wider stakeholder engagement through these sort of regional co-design efforts. Then a uh, few things related to policies, uh, because uh, I'm looking these uh, partially through the uh, through the lenses of, uh, for, of the ministry. So uh, there are clear uh, benefits in the regional co-development because then we can also identify synergies with regional policy development goals. And because often these regional policy development uh, programs have their own individual funding, so it might be possible to identify that how could these funds be used for the new European Bauhaus in a, an efficient, efficient way uh, and, and maybe to sharpen and, and to, to verbalize the goals of those already existing regional uh, development uh, initiatives. So I, I, I'm thinking that this new European Bauhaus helps to sharpen the goals of the already existing regional policy development forum. And then I think that the, the coherency of our Nordic voice in European policy development has been strengthened, strengthened uh, through, this, uh, through the uh, new, European, uh, new, new European Bauhaus initiative. So that can be understood as a, as a benefit as well. Then uh, it's interesting to see that the feedback from the co-design reinforces development needs of which many are already known. So I think that there are not that many like shocking news that, oh, there is an exceptional novel idea that nobody has ever thought of. But I think this is just fine. Uh, it sort of like uh, reinforces that uh, we are pretty well on the map and, and we have identified at least uh, several of those important development areas where, would need, where we would need to work on. And uh, I think this is, uh, if, if, there is uh, if there are now like no, no super exciting novel news uh, from a regional uh, co-design, uh, I don't think that that is a reason for a concern, quite the opposite. Then I think that it's easier to select how to fund and how to channel funds to those areas of, of co-design that would be uh, taken forward first. So it helps in the practical implementation, at least from my perspective. However, I clearly sense that there is promotion needed for the European Bauhaus. It's, uh, it became very apparent to us that the news about the new European Bauhaus have not at all reached all relevant stakeholder groups. And this applies on all levels. Uh, there are several ministries or authorities who have never heard of a new European Bauhaus. And they are very puzzled. What is that thing? And they confuse that with the hardware store with the same name. So is this about selling building products or something? And there are significant gaps in knowledge uh, especially uh, if we frame the new European Bauhaus so that it's something that's only for artists, designers and architects. So we have clearly seen that there might be a sort of like very high threshold for those non-artists or non-designers to, to jump along into this trade. And this I see as a clear risk. So, so there needs to be promotion about the new European Bauhaus, I'm speaking from my experience, of course, that, uh, that the new European Bauhaus is not only for artistically minded individuals, but it's, it could be something for all to take part in. However, as it is not very clear how the new European Bauhaus will take form in the future, it doesn't make it any easier to communicate to all stakeholder groups that, yes, jump into this train, but actually we don't know where the train is going but it appears to be a nice train. So we just need to trust that it is a, a trip with a purpose. And now, finally, I would like to take the opportunity of uh, giving my personal reflections as an architect. And these are my own views. These do not represent the views of the Nordic co-design uh, uh, webinars, nor do these represent the views of uh, the Ministry of the Environment or any other organizations. But these are just my personal reflections, because uh, during this spring, uh, I have had a chance and privilege to sit in so many Bauhaus meetings and, and talk uh, in so many Bauhaus webinars that 
it has been quite uh, refreshing uh, food for thought. So I would suggest, like to suggest four points or four questions, raise four questions uh, uh, for, the, for the development of the new European Bauhaus. The first question is that how uh, can we afford to build more? Or should we instead consider downscaling and sort of like a degrowth uh, approach to construction? And this, this is, of course, related to the huge uh, material consumption and immense energy consumption of the built environment. And as we all know that the population on this planet is, is just growing. So it makes no sense to keep on eating more and more of the cake that should serve the whole planet. So I think the, a, a serious and fundamental question for all, all of us who are in, in working with the built environment is that, can we afford to build more? And where can we afford to build more? And how will that be justified? Then uh, the next question is uh, that, should we consider an affair with artificial intelligence? And this is something that uh, gets back 100 years. Uh, when the original Bauhaus started, it was a sort of like a semi-scandal that those designers, they dared to have an affair with the industry and they dared to start designing furniture that was industrially producible, thus turning their back, as it was understood, to traditional arts and crafts sort of movement. So I'm just thinking that are we now in a position when we should really uh, consider a similar sort of like shocking affair not with industry at this time, but with artificial intelligence. Because the, the quality criteria and quantitative criteria that are set for modern construction and for the modern built environment are so difficult and complex and multi-layered that it's, human brains are not just capable of working with that very much longer. At least, uh, I'm, I would say, not with very good results. So I'm wondering uh, what would be the role of artificial intelligence here? And uh, that is a scary but also interesting question. It's easy for us to get dystopic views on this. But then again, if there are algorithms who could help us design better cities and, and buildings, why shouldn't we start designing those algorithms today? My third question uh, as a personal reflection is that should we consider leaving farewell to anthropocentric construction culture? So what is the uh, driver that puts us humans in the center of construction and the built environment? Are we only building for humans? Uh, as we know that the construction today is consuming 50% of annual raw materials of the planet. And we know that 90% of biodiversity loss is associated to extraction of materials. That puts construction and the design of the built environment at the very core of all biodiversity loss mitigating actions. So should we then think outside of the human box and try to make it uh, it might try to make this planet a livable place for other forms of life as well. And as a, a last question or uh, comment, I think that the role of empathy cannot be uh, underlined enough. The changes that our planet appears to be facing in the future are, can be very difficult. They can be very difficult for humans and for non-humans. And for understanding and accepting these changes and, and also accepting the difficult emotions that these might arise in us and people around us, either in the form of depression or denial or everything in between, uh, I think that calls for empathy. So these four points that I make as a personal reflection represent some of the feelings that I have been processing through the co-design phase of the new European Bauhaus here in the north. And again, I'd like to finish my presentation uh, with the same picture that I started with. The ultimate goal of the architect is to create a paradise. Now we just need to think, is the paradise inclusive for all? And who is to decide what sort of paradise? 
uh, the new European Bauhaus will be working for. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, we have one question uh, also for the other viewers. Our platform is open for questions if, if you have any. Um, but if you don't mind, uh, Matti, I'm going to ask you this question now that was sent through. Uh, the question is, what would be the role of schools and education in promoting cultural change? Yes, this is an excellent question. I'm also representing Aalto University, which is, which is an official partner uh, uh, in, the, in the European Bauhaus. And I, I see that this is, uh, uh, at least from my perspective, I see that as a facilitating role. It appears that the, the, the youth uh, and the young, young generation already uh, has a tremendous uh, understanding and, and sense of urgency about the shift that we need to make. And uh, uh, at least what I'm seeing is that they take that not only as a uh, processual change of doing something in an improved manner, but changing our behavior. So what us, the older generations who are running the schools and running the universities, I think that we should be open minded and offer a platform for facilitating that sort of change. And uh, at best, it could be a movement that the younger generation is engaged with. So we should make sure that we don't block that movement, but we give frames for it. Because I don't think that we necessarily can be an essential and integral part of it, other than uh, enabling it. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. Um, so thank you so much for your input and for the value, very valuable uh, intervention that you had. Uh, we will me be meeting back up for the afternoon sessions in two hours uh, where we will have two roundtables and we hope to see all of you there very soon.